day will come too. Every tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God. Amen. That's good. Well, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Genesis chapter 30 and verse number 24. I'm going to read one verse of scripture. Bereshith, that's a Hebrew word, means in the beginning. Genesis 30, verse number 24. She called his name Joseph and said, Jehovah, the Lord, shall add to me another son. Father, send this forth for the purpose you intend it. It will not return unto you void. It will accomplish that which you please. It will prosper in a thing whereto you've sent it. You make no mistakes. Thou art God, hallelujah, and beside you there is none other. I offer to thee today my life, my hope, my future, my very being. In Jesus' name, I pray for unction and anointing now to preach your word. Amen. I'm going to title the message this morning, Where Joseph Met Satan. Where Joseph Met Satan. Now the Bible says in the book of Genesis 37, Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told his brethren they hated him yet the more. So they despised Joseph. One of the reasons they despised him because he was spiritual. Joseph had a connection with God. God had a special love for Joseph. You can read in the book of Genesis where God said he made the stars also. That's all that. But he spends a quarter of the book of Genesis, one-fourth of it, one-fourth of the whole book of Genesis, talking about one man, Joseph. And he wasn't even in the Messianic line. Kind of makes you think that God can put his mind and his spirit and his soul and his eyes on someone. Yes, and he can do that for you. He's no respecter of persons. He's looking for someone this morning to be able to receive from God what he's able to do for you. Amen. Amen. Wouldst thou make, let me make you whole, he said? What would you have me to do? If you came in here to get rich, you don't know what riches are. Because if you know the Lord, you're already rich. You are beyond measure. You have that which can't be numbered. But Joseph met Satan. He certainly did. He started at home with him. His brethren hated him. Then they dug a pit and they put him in that pit or found a pit. Put him in there. Then they sold him to the Ishmaelites. Now you know what an Ishmaelite is? An Ishmaelite, the tribe of Ishmael. Who was Ishmael? He was 13-year-old son of Abraham that, that Abraham said, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee when God gave the prophecy that the seed would be blessed. And God said, No, it's not through him. So there's a problem with Ishmael from the very beginning. If you want to know what's going on in the Temple Mount right now and all these Arab countries around there, study Ishmael and you'll find out exactly what's happening because the scripture has much to say about it. But he met him and Satan met him at home even though he'd been blessed of God. He met him in a pit even though his brethren hated him. And then he met him in a slave market. Here's the one that was receiving dreams from God yet he was on the auction block to be sold and Potiphar bought him he noticed in him right off the bat that he was a special young man the Bible tells us that Joseph was goodly in appearance he was a handsome man definitely handsome to make special note of it Uh, he was sold into Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife as you read the Bible you understand what she tried to do she tried to seduce him have you ever heard of the Da Vinci Code You've heard of it. Dan Brown wrote the book. It's a famous painting of the Lord's Supper with an effeminate John, which is in the code Mary Magdalene. In plain words, Leonardo da Vinci was trying to get a message across by feminizing the apostle John. And if you look at that thing, this is what they're trying to say. So what's the point? The point is that the Lord Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene supposed to have had children. That started with the Gnostic Gospels that were found at Nag Hammadi back in 1947 and produced the Merovingian bloodline, which is supposed to be the bloodline of Christ's descendants in Europe 
And of course, the point is, if he started this, then he'll end it in ruling the world. So if you're a part of the Merovingian bloodline, then you can expect to rule the world one day. Problem is, it's all a lie. It's all a lie. They took, they took Mary Magdalene, a woman who loved the Lord, who had seven devils cast out of her, and they turned her into a goddess. They turned her into a pervert. They turned her into everything in the world but the truth of who she was. He met him in a dungeon. Satan came to uh, Joseph when he'd been locked up for something he did not do because this woman came upon him. In that dungeon, he no doubt probably had Satan come upon him and say, what are you doing here? Did not, uh, did not the Almighty give you visions and dreams? I mean, <laughs> where are your dreams now? I'm going to tell you something, folks. You're never going to grow, grow and you're never going to have a relationship with the Lord till you find out who Satan is. You're going to find him. You'll know him. And let me tell you something else about Satan. Satan's a spirit being that has a reason for existence. He has a reason for being. God uses Satan. He uses everything. Nothing can exist except it come forth from him. In Psalm, in the book of Isaiah 45, he said, I create evil. I do all these things. When you study the Bible, you'll understand in the sense and what that means. But just keep in mind, God never reacts to anything. He never reacts. Known unto God are all of his works. Everything that can or will happen comes forth from that eternal absolute being, the Almighty, who sends you your breath of air today who created everything that you know and gives you life in your being. I love him and I bless him and I praise him and I glorify his holy name. Amen. I'm not living in some happenstance place where anything could happen and nothing and you have no, you have no consciousness of it. I serve the Lord. I'm going to get up tomorrow because he says get up tomorrow. I'll be alive tonight because he allows me to live tonight. My life is in his hands. He doesn't tell me what he's going to do, but I know one thing, he will do what he's going to do. The Bible said no man can stay his hand. So you need to learn this. Though you set out and you're going to serve the Lord and you love him, there's going to be obstacles in your way. Things are going to divert you. You're going to have problems. It's going to happen. It's going to happen, but God has a reason for it happening. When the wind blows against these huge trees out here, it causes them to drive their roots deeper into the ground. To, su to sustain them against the wind when it comes. And that's what he wants you to do. When the Holy Spirit begins to move on your soul as you go through a trial, bury your roots deeper into Christ. Yes. Seek out his word. Yes. Find what God says in his word that will help you. Ask him. There's a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge. You can go to a university and have your head filled full of knowledge. There's nothing wrong with knowledge. But my dear friend, if that's all you got, you're nothing but a walking encyclopedia. You need wisdom. And wisdom can only come from God. And that wisdom is what gives you the difference between this world's wisdom and the wisdom of the Almighty. Ask God for wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. If you'll really ask God to give you wisdom, the Bible will open up for you. It'll come alive. You'll begin to see the undercurrent of God Almighty as he moves in that book. We've been studying the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon on Wednesday night. And Lord willing, go back into it this coming Wednesday night. The Song of Solomon. Did you know there are two words that don't even show up in the Song of Solomon? The word sin and the word God. Neither one of them are in that book. Wonder why. Come Wednesday night and we'll talk about why. Did you know the book of Esther? Hadassah, the queen of the king. Did you know that the word God doesn't show up one time in the whole book of Esther? You'd think the Lord would want his name in there at least one time, wouldn't you? No, he didn't write the book to please you. He wrote the book to teach you. He wrote the book to get you on your knees and open your Bible. And that's wisdom from God. God is all through the book of Esther, but in a different way than you normally see him. Amen. He's in your life in the same way, folks. Sometimes people expect it to be blaring in your face because you're so burned out on TV. You live in a superficial, skimming world where you're spoon-fed. You're used to that. That's how you live your life. When you understand that if you'll spend just a little bit of time and reach out to God, he'll begin to open up to you a world that you didn't even know existed. And that world will bless your soul. That's what keeps me going. The ministry doesn't keep me going and people don't keep me going. What keeps me going, God does. 
because I pray, Lord, show me, help me, I feed me. I need you. I need your wisdom. I need your spirit. I need your presence. I can't make it without you. You know something, folks, as long as I've been saved, I realize now more than I ever have in all my life, I can't do anything without him. I need God. Amen. I need him. I need him. And I need him. I need him. When he faced his brethren again, Satan met him. Here is an opportunity. He could have blasted them. He could have condemned them. But no, he didn't. He loved them. Why? Because he rose above them. They didn't love him, but he loved them. This is power. This is authority. This is where you love your enemies. You love those that hate you. You're rising above them. So we learned some lessons from that. Did you know that from Adam we learned sacrifice? He gave his life for his wife. He sure did. God could have given him another wife, but he said, no, I'm going to keep this one. And I'm going to die for her. If you, if you do away with her, do away with me too. For he ate of that fruit. He didn't have to eat of that fruit. He knew what would happen when he ate of that fruit. And the Bible tells us that Eve was deceived. When she ate that fruit, she was deceived and was in the transgression. But Adam was never deceived. He walked into it with his eyes wide open. That's a great lesson to learn from Adam. Noah, we learn obedience. Everybody in the world called Noah a fool, made fun of him, laughed at him. But Noah built an ark and it saved his family, didn't it? That's what obedience is about. It's going against the flow. It's going against conventional wisdom. It's going against the tide. We see Abraham, the pilgrim, the servant of God, his life. He never had a house, but he lived in a tent all of his life. In Jacob, we see the transformation of a sinner and a long-suffering God. God was with Jacob a long time until he became the prophet. From the usurper to the prophet, that's what Jacob did. He's with you. He's with you. Some of you got mad at him, turned from him. Your faith has failed you, but he hadn't failed you and he won't fail you and he won't turn from you. He said, I'll never leave thee. I'll never forsake thee. Amen. He will be with you until the very end. Samuel, we see the spiritual leader of an entire nation. Samuel, one man, rose above all the rest of them. Not the high priest. Not No, Samuel rose above every last one of them. In the entire, and from David, we see the warrior servant. Their men are called upon to go to the battlefield. They have to go out there and kill people or be killed. They watch people being blown all to pieces. A lot of times they say, where's God? I'm going to tell you one thing. There's probably more praying done on the battlefield than in most houses, church houses. Amen. You better believe it. <laughs> yes, sir. They've met God in the foxhole. He's in that foxhole. He was the warrior servant. Oh, yeah. David was. Solomon, we see the definition of true love. We learn a lesson from Solomon. Oh, yes, he apostatized, one of the worst that ever lived. Sure he did. He brought child sacrifice into Israel. But at the beginning, he had the wisdom of God. God gave him wisdom. And you know what he did? He taught you the lesson of what true love was about. You mean what's true love, preacher? True love is where that prostitute who didn't even know who the daddy of her child was, was willing to let him live with somebody else than to see him die. And they saw true love. You want, to, you want to know what will heal America? The Republicans and the Democrats are not going to heal America. No, they won't do it, folks. They won't do it. Don't put your faith in news stations and news channels and news. Don't, don't do it. I'm warning you. I don't care how conservative they come across. Don't put your faith in Newsmax or Fox or NBC, CBS, ABC, or any of the rest of them. Put your faith in God. He won't change. They will. You're already watching one of them change before your eyes right now. Amen. That's wisdom. Put your trust in the Lord. So what do you mean? If the real love broke out in this country where dads would go fight to the death for their families and people learned what a man was about, you'd see a change take place in this country. Did you know that in this state of Tennessee, they had passed a law to where the drag queens cannot come before your children and drag them into performances. They don't want drag queens messing with the kids. Did you know that one federal judge cast it down, one man sitting on a bench cast down the will of the electorate in this state. He stood against it and yet that crowd screams democracy. The voice of the people. Well, the voice of the people of the state of Tennessee said, we don't want drag queens in front of our kids. And one man. Now, folks, learn something. Watch what's going on. 
Voltaire, who's one of the sorriest men that ever lived, he said, let me give you just a little wisdom. Voltaire said this. He said, to find out who's in power, find out who you can't criticize. And you'll find out real fast. How many still with me? We'll bring the band in in a little while. We'll get some Kool-Aid. How about that? Kool-Aid would be good, wouldn't it? You know Jim Jones and Guyana down there? Oh, yeah. Wake up. Wake up. It's already past what you think it is. They're, I'm, they're coming for your children. They want your kids. But I see one ray of light. How many of you see the ray of light? How many of you see the parents standing up against Gay Pride Month and against the gay marches and against the lesbians and against the, and, and against the, uh, and, and the drag queens and all the rest of that? Parents are saying, hold on. If that's the way you want to live, there's nothing we can do about it. Live it. But leave our kids alone. What's wrong with that? Leave. The, now, step two, since they want to come in front of your kids, what does that mean? Does that mean that they're simply entertaining your children? Or are they grooming your children? Sure they are. You know what it is. Nobody's got to tell you. Christ had to feel what the sinner feels in order to do what he can do. The Bible says in Revelation 12, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Now has come salvation, strength, the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. There are many themes in the Bible, but I want to give you one right now, folks, that is so important. It took me decades to really get a hold of what I'm saying to you now. Please listen to me. Because I want to help you. One of the most important things that you'll ever learn in the Bible is the forgiveness of sins. What's it based upon? What's going on with the forgiveness of sins? You acknowledge the fact that you are a sinner. If you don't acknowledge that fact, you're a fool. Because you've called God a liar. You say you don't sin. First John 1, 9, it says this. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many's ever made it through a day and you didn't sin? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Amen. It's better be thought a fool and raise your hand and remove all doubt. Sure you do. But here's the key to it. Here's the key. This is what's important about it. The word confess is the Greek word hamalagia. It means to agree in word, to agree in thought, to agree in principle, to agree in communication. What he says to you, you listen from him and you walk with him. If you're listening to God and walking in fellowship, you're walking free from the condemnation of sin. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses from all sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, Romans chapter number 8. You have to do that. If you're not doing that, you're trusting your mind and you're trusting your heart Amen. to give you fellowship with God. And I'm telling you right now, you're going down. You can't trust your mind and you can't trust your heart. You have to trust fellowship with God by walking in the light. And that is in agreement with the Holy Spirit of God Amen. as he moves upon your heart. Do that. Please do that. Think about what I'm saying to you. Somebody says, well, it can't be that simple. It can't be that simple. You mean to tell me that if I just confess my sin, confess what I've done, when he puts his finger upon something in my life, he wants, conf he wants fellowship with you? You mean all I got to do is confess it? That's exactly right. Agree with God. Amen. Somebody said, well, I must have the right attitude. If I don't have the right attitude, God's not going to forgive me. Where's that in the Bible? Because who do you know has the right attitude? Do you know you've got the right attitude? Can, can you self-analyze yourself? Put yourself on a, on a couch and call yourself a shrink and just do a good job on yourself. And, and you, you know, you, you got your, and I don't know me. I don't know me. He knows me. There's a lot going on inside me right here that I know I'm not too good with. I really don't know that well, but I know him. That's the one I trust. Somebody said, well, I must do something. Here's religion standing up and says, I got to do something. There's no way in the world God can forgive me. It's simply by that. I got to do something. That's penance. And when you bring penance into it, you've taken the grace of God out of it. Any issue you bring in where you got to do something, then you're taking credit for what you're doing. That's what I mean. It makes you feel better. 
but it has nothing to do with the forgiveness of your sins. You know why you're forgiven? You're forgiven on the basis of who Christ is and what he's done. Period. What, he is, what he's done and who he is. Somebody said, well, I must feel something. I came to the altar, I prayed, you know, and I confessed my sin, but I don't feel anything. Is that the way you live? You feel, feel, feel all day long? You still, how many of you feel like you still love your wife? Raise, no, don't raise your hand. <laughs> we don't want to start divorces in here. Amen. You ever get mad at your wife? Yep. You didn't really feel like you loved her at that time, did you? Of course not. Your feelings will fool you. They're the most, they're the most you know, the most changing, inconsistent things in your life. Then somebody says, well, I've got to pay something. Got to do that. I mean, at least I can do. I mean, he saved me. He forgave me of all this stuff. What have I, why I got to pay something? No, you don't pay anything. It's already paid for. Amen. Let me tell you something about Amen. paying too. When the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, he paid for every sin in the past, yes. in the present, and in the future. Amen. He paid for all of them, folks. Amen. Not just part of them, all of them. Amen. Paid for them all. Hallelujah to God. Ephesians 6.11 says, put on the whole armor of God. You may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That Greek word wiles is methodia. Can you make a connection in English with that? What would it be? That's right, method. Came straight from Greek. Methodia, just a little change. His wiles. We're not foolish of them. We're not stupid. What are the wiles of the devil? Clever schemes used by Satan to tempt, threaten, intimidation. He's wily at it wiles of the devil put on the whole armor of God it says you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil the Bible said in 2nd Corinthians lest Satan should get an advantage of us we're not ignorant of his devices there's another word devices uh, na -e -ma. that's the Greek word what's that mean that means thought to perceive in plain words he goes to work on your mind the mind you see, the mind has a mind of its own. Yeah, it does. So the Bible says that you have to keep this mind, bring it into subjection. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Things feed your mind. TV feeds your mind. What you read feeds your mind. Crowds you run with feed your mind. Problems you go through and you don't see solutions, that feeds your mind. A direct confrontation with Satan will feed your mind because you'll feel a spiritual presence and you can't explain it. Sometimes you can come into the presence of a, a appears to be a holy spirit and it's not. It's a deception. That's why you've got to try the spirits. This is not an easy walk. And you're at least it's not going to do you any good. You're going to have to come back to Christ. You're going to have to get back before him. You're going to have to seek him. You're going to have to take hold of him. You're going to have to pull him into your life. You're going to have to come to him and say, Lord Jesus, I can't live without you. I can't do it. I can't make it. I can't do it. That's good talk right there. It humiliates you. It attacks your pride. It assaults your idea of who you are. I am who Christ says I am, not who I think I am. Your mind, your mind, your mind. A lot of people have more trouble with it than others because a lot of people read a lot. They're inquisitive. They think. They reach into things. They want to find out what this is based upon. Where'd this come from? What's this about? And they start digging into stuff. If you're not careful, you're going to dig into a hole that'll take hold of you and suck the very life out of your soul. Luke 22, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you sweet. It's amazing how he had to come to the Lord Jesus to do that, didn't he? Aren't you glad? Amen. I'm glad. Yes. He doesn't consult with the deacon board or the no. Sanhedrin or the pastors. No. He has to come to the Lord Jesus. You know why? Because the Lord Jesus is the one who pleads my case at the right hand of the Father. And he can't approach me without that, and I'm so thankful. But look what he says in John 12, 13, 2. Supper being ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And you can get into all of, uh, all of the, uh, the ideas about why Judas did what he did. But the bottom line is a thief. He carried the bag. No question about that. What did that mean? The thievery opened the door for him to become the fulfillment of the prophecy of the scripture. The denier, the betrayer, the one that sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Where did it come from? It came from Satan. He worked on his mind. 
The Bible said the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He said, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Mind warfare. Such were some of you, but you're washed. Such were some of you, but you're washed. You mean to tell me, preacher, that I'm sitting in a church with a bunch of sinners around me? Yeah, and you're one of them. If you're looking for one of those clean, highbrow churches, you probably need to move on down the road a little ways. <laughs> We're just a bunch of old boys in here, and you know, girls, we've, we've met the Lord, and we've all got a past, but thank God it's past. Amen. 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 I, I don't know how big your closet full of bones is, but I got a pretty good size one. <laughs> Amen. But you know, that's where it is, and such were some of you. Yeah, you were. But you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and of the Spirit of God. Here's one of the ways that he'll mess with your mind. He'll attack God's word. I need to say this. I believe that KJV is God's word. Now, folks, I'm, 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 I'm telling you something. Do you hear me quote Greek all the time, Hebrew and all this stuff? I've been there. I've had three years of Greek and two years of Hebrew, okay? I'm not a scholar when it comes to that, but you won't flim-flam me either. And I believe that Bible. Now, here's the problem. Do you have a Bible that you believe? Amen. You say, well, I've got the NIV. You can get saved out of the NIV. You can get saved out of any of them, for that matter, if they got enough of the truth in them. That's not the issue. The issue is how does it relate with your, relation, with your relationship with the Lord? Where's your, where's your foundation? I mean, really, has it established you in your faith? I believe that book. I don't waste my time trying to find fault in the Bible. It finds enough fault in me without me having to find fault in it. Really? Really? I've got computer programs, folks, with 50 translations. I, I could take you back here and show you all kinds of translations of the Bible. I've got all that stuff. But, folks, I believe one. Now, does that make me better than you? No. But what it says to anybody is, and let me warn you, okay, especially if you're a young preacher, you're a young man, a young, young Christian, before you buy into this business about, well, a better translation could be this or this or this or this, spend a little bit of time searching it out for yourself and pray over that and say, now, Lord, where's this leading me? And, and, you know, I mean, this, all this stuff, what's it doing to me spiritually? Are you growing from it? Are you, are you tossed here and tossed there? I believe the Bible you say, is the, King James perfect? is the King James Bible perfect? It's God's Word. Is God's Word perfect? You say, well, the originals are perfect. This is an English Bible. This is an English Bible. It's a translation from Greek and Hebrew and some Aramaic. All right. This is the Bible. If you believe the Bible, if you, if you don't have a Bible that you can take up in your hands and say, I believe it from cover to cover then you've got a problem. Somebody says, well, you say, preacher, now I've got about 30 translations that I believe. Oh, do you? Okay, good. Good for you. <laughs> of course, you understand they don't agree with each other, do you? Twisting scripture, Psalm chapter number 91. Satan quoted the Bible to the Lord Jesus Christ and he twisted it. The Bible said there are those who twist the scripture to their own destruction. Let the, speak, let the, let the scripture speak. Let it speak. Let it speak. Well, what if I don't understand it? That's okay. It's a good time to pray. Amen. The Bible is not written for you to understand everything that's in it right off the bat. It's written because it's the Word of God, and it's a manifestation of God's mind, His thought, His revelation to humanity, to mankind. Do you realize how long it took to write that book? 1,900 years before Christ, Job lived. 19 B.C., 1900 B.C. He was a contemporary of Abraham, lived, lived about the same time. But Moses did not write the Pentateuch until about 1400 B.C. That's about 500 years later. Now, we don't know when Job was written, so you're going to hear different things. You're going to hear some preachers say it took 14 or 1500 years. That's all right. But it could be 2,000 years. Because we don't know who wrote Job. And if Job was written 1,900 years before Christ, the canon of Scripture was closed about 100 A.D. So what have you got? You've got 2,000 years, see, 
Big difference. Yeah. But don't pick people to death. If some preacher says it's 14 or 1500 years, that's all right, no problem. But 2000 years is one I accept. And that's a long time to write yeah. one book. Think about that, 2000 years to write the scripture. The Bible said in Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We're in a battle, folks. We're in a battle. They take these young men, they take them out of high school, they take them out of college. They play ball, football, baseball, basketball, and all that. You know, physically they're in good shape, they're athletes. And they take them from the culture that they're in here. They take them from this culture. Then they stick them down there in Vietnam, okay? They hand them a, in my time it was an M14, then an M16. They hand them that weapon. And they put them out in the jungle. They don't understand, some of them, that there are people out there that are going to kill them. Just as soon as they can, they're going to blow their brains out. They just have to be hardened to that. They have to be ready for that. They have to be set for that. And until then, it's kind of like they're in another world. It's, what's going on? Why, why do they want to kill me? You know, I don't even know these people. That's warfare. You're in war tonight, this morning. You are. You are in warfare. You're living in a generation in America that we've never seen in this country before. Amen. You're, li you're living in a transitional generation. You're watching things change, and my, the folks there are moving exponentially. I mean, it's amazing at how quickly things are happening. You're watching this happen right before your very eyes. You're watching the old America, the old, for the most part, Christian America, the old hard-working America, the America of the Constitution, you know, that America, and you're watching a new communistic, fascist, atheistic America. And it wants to take away all that you grew up with. It wants to take away everything that you hold dear. And it wants to bring upon you some new thing, and the very foundation of it is perversion. And they want your kids. They want your children. So this is why we fight. The Apostle Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Wrestling 2,000 years ago was not like it is today. Strangling, butting, kicking, twisting, crushing, gouging, biting. A wrestler might twist an opponent's foot out of its socket, break his fingers, rip off his ears, break the nose with a clenched fist. A powerful jab to the belly with extended fingers might pierce the stomach and tear the entrails out or gouge their very eyes out. Now, check me out if you think I'm being, this is hyperbole, check me out. Check me out. Well, you're saying that's horrible. That's what Paul said wrestling was yeah. 2,000 years ago. Greco-Roman wrestling. It's quite a thing. It's passed down to us today. Of course, they don't do that. But you look at college wrestling and some of that, it's quite a thing. Uh, it's quite a competition. Matter of fact, uh, but we wrestle not. So Satan is trying to do to you what they did to each other then. He wants to break your feet and lay you up. He wants to strangle you so you can't witness. He wants to gouge out your eyes so you can no longer see the battle. He wants to leave you dead so you'll pose no threat to him. Ancient Greeks did not view their Olympid, Olympics in this way. A second century inscription found at Olympia relates the ancient Olympic spirit with quiet dignity. Here's what it says. This is the inscription. It's 1,800 years old. Agathus Diamond, nicknamed the camel from Alexandria, a victor at Nema, he died here boxing in the stadium. Now, this boxing was a form of of the wrestling. He prayed to Zeus for victory or death. He died. He was 35. They said farewell to him. That's how seriously they took it. That's how serious it is. You ever watch Christian die around you? You ever watch one give up? 
You ever watch one just kind of begin to compromise to where they can't see right or wrong any longer? They don't even know what they're here for. They don't know what this battle's about. It's a battle for souls, folks. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's a battle for souls. Are you in it or are you out of it? Have you quit or are you still going? I don't know if you call it a curse or a blessing. I don't know where it came from, but I know what I am. I can't quit. God, I've already told the Lord, God, when you're done with me, take me. I don't want to sit somewhere and just, and just, and just live to be 90 years old and not worth a dime. Amen. Use me, and when you get done with me, take me. And let me fight until the very end. Let me fight as long as I can fight. I want to do that. Now, some of you, you know, you don't, you don't care anything about that. You put your time in on Sunday. You're ready to go for the rest of the week. You couldn't care less. Some of you, this will move your heart and stir your soul. Amen. Fight. Fight. Amen. Last thing they taught us, and I'll shut up with this. It says, when your buddy gets shot or injured on the battlefield, you do not leave him on that field. Amen. Amen. In, uh, in, the middle, in the Marine Corps, they call him corpsman, the Navy. We had a president a few years back, didn't know one from a side of a wall. What do you call him, a corp, corpsman? Yeah, he called him a corpsman. I bet those Navy corpsmen, I bet they would anyway. That's like putting a draft dodger in as the president. We had one of them too, remember him? And these guys are supposed to go out on the battlefield. You don't let him, you don't leave him, you don't leave him, you don't leave him. And they, I'm sure all these military uh, branches teach the same thing. You don't leave him. You don't leave him. Why don't you support each other? Amen. Why don't you come to church and support each other? Why don't you pray for each other? Why don't you do it? Some of you, you look at When you die, where are you going? I'm going to heaven. I don't want to see a Christian fall. If he does, I'll get down there with him, pray with him, and help him. We're in a battle. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to die on the battlefield. In that old song, I'm going to die on the battlefield. If he takes me when I'm on the battlefield, I know that I've finished my course. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time together. You gave this to me, Lord, and I've given out what you gave me. May it help someone. That was the motive in it. That was the purpose. May it help someone. Some of them it won't help. I know that. I've known them too long. I know it. It won't help them. It won't make a better difference in their life. But some of them it may make a difference. They may look at their family and think, good night, man. What's happening to my kids? What's going on here? And maybe they'll wake up and realize that it's way past what they thought it was. That we're in a battle for our very life, for our families, for our children, for our homes. We're in a battle. The heads are bowed, nobody looking. Anybody in this house this morning say, Preacher Lawson, I got kids to raise, I got little children. I need the wisdom of God to know who to, who to let them go with. Friendship, where to go, entertainment, what to watch on TV, and uh, what books to read. What, to, what just God's got to tell me. He's got to show me what I need. Yes, he does. Would you raise your hand? Father, you see these hands that go up this morning. And they're parents, Lord. They're parents with, with kids, Father. Lord, my little girl's in her 50s now, and I've got three, teenage, uh, three uh, grandchildren that are already grown up except for one. Heavenly Father, I pray for them. I pray in Jesus' name. I pray for them. Lord, move in their hearts now. Let them do something about this this morning. <clears throat> Let them come and pick up that uh, Samson had a jawbone. Let them pick it up again and go back into battle. And really take a good look at what we're here for. What's all this about? What are we doing? I pray this in Jesus' name. 
Would you like to get up out of your seat and come down the front here and we'll pray with you?